How you doing? James Swanick here. Great to have you here. And today I'm going to teach you how to speed read, how I read a book a day. So full disclosure, a book a day, when I say I read a book a day, is on the day that I read books, I read a book a day. At the moment, I'm not quite doing seven books a week. I'm doing four, often five. So I'm taking the weekend off. So to say I read a book a day, uh, just to clarify, is I'm reading a book a day on the days that I start reading a book. Uh, but I'm not reading seven books a week at the moment. Now, I've gone on a run before where I've read a book a day and I've kept it up for 14 days in a row. But there's always something that pops up. Something gets in the way in my life. I'm traveling and it's just impossible to keep up with that schedule. But I'm going to teach you or I'm going to tell you how I read a book a day and how you can read a book a day on the, uh, on the schedule or on your schedule because I get a lot of messages from guys asking me about that. Uh, just to put it into context, my mentor, Ty Lopez, over at the Ty Lopez Show, he was the one who really instilled in me this reading, reading a book a day to get that into. He reads a book a day. And he says that I was the first person that he told read a, to read a book a day to actually start reading a book a day. <laughs> Even though at the moment it's not actually a book a day because I'm only doing four or five books a week. But would you like to have the power to be able to read a book a day when you open it up? So I'm going to teach you how to do it. Now, before I do that, just a little bit of housekeeping stuff to talk to you about. Uh, this will just take one minute. So uh, you'll notice that in the last three weeks, I've scaled back to two episodes a week. I was doing a ferocious pace of seven podcast episodes a week. And then I scaled back to five and sometimes I did six. Then I experimented with five again. And then the last couple of weeks I've been experimenting with just doing two. You didn't seem to like that. <laughs> you seem to want a lot more than that. Uh, judging by the messages that I got. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find a happy medium and I'm going to now try three episodes a week, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. I'm going to release it at five minutes past midnight uh, Pacific Coast time. That's California, Los Angeles, West Coast America time on a Monday, five minutes past the hour on a Wednesday, and five minutes past the hour on a Friday. I'm going to try that for the next month and see how you, you like that. Please do let me know. Post a review in the rating section and let me know whether that's okay. Is that enough? Is it too few? Is it too many? Two a week apparently is too few. So thank you so much for those who emailed me to let me know that two a week wasn't enough. Uh, so I'm going to try three. I think three might be a happy medium, but we'll see. Remember, I'm here to serve you. I want to make sure that I'm giving you exactly what you want. That includes the length and duration of each of these uh, interviews that I do or the, the, the ramblings that I pull out, like today, teaching you how to uh, read a book a day. So please do let me know. Also, I'm trying to build up my James Swanick official Facebook page. And so would you do me a favor and go to James Swanick official in Facebook? That'll be facebook.com forward slash James Swanick official and like that page. And if you do that, I'm going to send you my free notes. I'm going to send you the notes that I took on three great books that I've read. Never Eat Alone by Keith Ferrazzi, Winning with People by John C. Maxwell and Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. If you go over to James Swanick official and you like the page and you leave me a comment, I'm going to send you my free notes the notes that I took when I read those books and I typed out the notes and I PDF'd it and I'm going to just send it, send it to you uh, as a gift to say thank you. So please do head over to James Swanick Official. I'm also going to, uh, or rather I would encourage you please also to follow me on Twitter at, at James Swanick, J-A-M-E-S-S-W-A-N-W-I-C-K. I'm also on Instagram at uh, James Swanick. All right, let's just get into this. I'm going to teach you how to read a book a day. So just if you're watching on the video, because um, I'm releasing a video and an audio now on this podcast, but if you're looking on the video, I'm in my apartment in West Hollywood. You can see my bookshelf behind me. 
And they're all the books that I've read recently. Actually, that's not true. There's about five books there that just came in in uh, the mailman delivered, the Amazon delivery guy delivered uh, yesterday. Um, and I'm going to start reading them this week. Let me just grab them. Okay, here they are here. So these are the books that I ordered online. I actually ordered $298 worth of books on Amazon uh, earlier this week and five of them have turned up. And if you're watching on the video, then here they are. Here are the ones I got. I got the Hilton. Uh, it's called The Hilton's, The True Story of an American Dynasty by J. Randy Tarabarelli. It's about uh, the Hilton Empire, including Paris Hilton there, but how they built the Hilton hotel chain. I've got Contiki. Uh, story of a voyage across the ocean um, filled with adventure and death. Social by Matthew Lieberman. The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins. And then a book by uh, Marie Forleo called Make Every Man Want You because, uh, as you may know, I'm also inspiring women to attract their dream man. So I need to be well read on all things to do with attracting men for women. So they're the books that I'm going to be reading. Uh, it's Monday now. Tomorrow, I'm going to read Social by Matthew Lieberman. And then Tuesday, I'm going to read Contiki. Then Wednesday, The Selfish Gene. Thursday, Make Every Man Want You. And then The Hiltons, which is quite big. And it'll take a little bit longer. I'll probably leave to Saturday uh, when i got a little bit more time. All right, let's do this. So how do you read a book a day? So... I've got four books here I'm going to do an example with, okay, that I've read recently. Sell or Be Sold by Grant Cordone, Sam Walton, Made in America, Grinding It Out by Ray Kroc, and Omnimore's Moore's uh, Dilemma by uh, Michael Pollan. So what I did when I read Omnivore's Dilemma, A Natural History of Four Meals by Mo Michael Pollan, what I do when I pick up any book is I read the back of the book first, okay? I read the back of the book. And it says, today, buffeted by one food fad or after another, America is suffering from what can only be described as a national eating disorder. Will it be fast food tonight or something organic? Or perhaps something we grew ourselves? The question of what to have for dinner has confronted us since man discovered fire. But as Michael Pollan explains in this revolutionary book, how we answer it now at the dawn of the 21st century may determine our survival as a species. Packed with profound surprises, the omnivores develop dilemma is changing the way Americans think about the politics, perils, and pleasures of eating. So already when I read that, I now understand what the book is about. Okay, I understand what I'm going to get. The next thing I do is I go to the contents page. Okay, so I'm flipping it here. If you're looking on the video, I'm showing you the contents page. And I'm reading the name of the chapters, the contents. The plant, Corn's Conquest. Chapter two, the farm. Chapter three, the elevator. Chapter four, the feedlot, making meat. Chapter five, the processing plant, making complex fluids. Six, the consumer, a republic of fat. Seven, the meal, fast food. Okay, so already I'm reading that and I'm going, okay, so obviously he's going to talk about what foods are fatty, fast food being fat, the farm. He's going to be tr trying to paint a picture here of how food is created or made in the farm and how it gets onto our plates. Then the chapters continue. All flesh is grass, big organic, 13 ways of looking at a pasture, slaughter in a glass abattoir, the meal, grass-fed. Okay, so now he's going to talk about grass-fed meat. If I don't know anything about grass-fed meat, I'm finding this quite interesting. Uh, and then, the, and then the, the chapter list continues. The ethics of eating animals, chapter 18, hunting, the meat, 19, gathering, the fungi. Chapter 20, The Perfect Meal. So before I've actually read even one word of this book, at least not, not the, the back of the book or the chapters, I'm already forming an opinion in my mind about what, this, what I'm going to get with this book. Now, sometimes I'll go to Wikipedia and I'll type in the name of the book. And I'll do this for like literally two minutes. So I'll go to Wikipedia. Let's just do it now while, I've, while I'm doing this. So I'll go to Wikipedia. And I'll type in omnivores, omnivores dilemma, omnivores dilemma. There we go. So that comes up. I click on that. 
And it says, Omnivore's Develop is a uh, Dilemma is a nonfiction book by Michael Pollan published in 2006. In the book, Pollan asked the seemingly straightforward question of what we should have for dinner. As omnivores, the most unselective eaters, humans are faced with a wide variety of food choices resulting in a dilemma. Pollan suggests that prior to modern food preservation and transportation technologies, this particular dilemma was largely resolved primarily through cultural influences. These technologies have created the dilemma by making available foods that were previously seasonal or regional. The relationship between food and society, once moderated by culture, now finds itself confused. To learn more about those choices, Poland follows each of the food chains that sustain us, industrial food, organic food, and food we forage ourselves, from the source to a final meal, and in the process, writes a critique of the American way of eating. Now, how long have I been talking to you since I started reviewing this book? About three minutes, almost three minutes. So the first three minutes, I've looked at the back of the book. I've looked at the back of the book. I've looked at the contents. I've looked at the Wikipedia page. And now I know exactly what I'm going to get in this book. Now I'm formulating an opinion or an idea about what I'm going to learn. And quite frankly, I wouldn't even have to read one word of this book to know that what he's going to say is eat grass-fed meat. Don't eat processed food. He's probably going to say, he's probably going to show how, how big industry uh, produces crap food and processed food and how it's killing us. So I know, so that's what I know. I know, I already know that about the book and that, I've known that in three minutes. Now, the biggest question I always get is, do you just skim read? Like, do you just read some of it and like fl flip over most of it? And the answer is no. And a little bit of yes. So if you're watching the video right now, let's go to uh, chapter one. Introduction, our natural eating disorder. Okay. So what I'm doing here now, now that I've read the chapters, is that I'm looking at the first page and I'm literally, my eyes are going scanning over the words as quickly as I can. Now, this is going to take a little bit of practice because when I used to, to read, I would go, I would read every word and I wouldn't turn the page until I'd read every word and it would just take forever. So now I'm looking at the front page and I'm going, what should we have for dinner? This book is along. Yep. Yep. For me, there's 30. Okay. I'm scanning the first line of every paragraph and then I'm letting my eyes drop down to read the other five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten lines below that first line and trying for it to register in my brain and digest that information. And I can do it because I've practiced it. So I'm scanning, I'm scanning, I'm scanning. I'm not going, what set off the sea change? It appears to have been a perfect media storm of diet books, scientific studies, and one timely magazine article. Instead, I'm reading it like, what set off the sea change appears of person like that. And it does register in the brain. Yes, you can comprehend what is, what is being said. So yes, I am skimming to a degree in the sense that I'm not focusing on every single little word. But I am seeing every word, but in a split millisecond of a millisecond. And that's enough for the meaning of it to get through to me. So I'm skimming like this. And I'll show you on the video. Um, for those listening on the audio, uh, you can just listen to me turning the pages. But this is how quickly I might read a page. All right, here we go. I'm going to flip over and let's just time it, shall we? Okay, uh, hang on. Three, two, one. All right, I'm reading here. The last amount of brand space and time. Rat must make uh, one way to make another thing. I like the staying behind ourselves. Okay, bang. How long was that? About 10 seconds. I read two pages there. Okay, and I know exactly what it was about. He's talking about the fields of corn growing in places uh, like Iowa and the culture of food and how the food goes from Iowa into the trucks and then moves. That's on page four and five. Then I'm flipping over and I'm going, right, what am I looking for? I'm looking for things that stand out. Okay, here's a sentence. We're not only what we eat, but how we eat too. I'm flipping over again. I'm scanning. I'm looking at the top. I'm looking at the first sentence of each paragraph and then I'm scanning down. I'm looking. I'm looking. What interests me? Okay, what am I trying to find here? Right, I'm flipping again. How and what we eat determines to a great extent the use we make of the world. Pleasures of eating. Okay, the kinds of pleasure are not deepened by knowing. 
what is perhaps most troubling and sad about industrial eating is how thoroughly it was Okay, great. So now I'm moving on. So I've already covered 18 pages of the book and I'm understanding. Now this chapter is called The Plant, Corn's Conquest. Okay, so now having read the Wikipedia page, having read the back, I'm going to know that he's going to be talking about the birth of corn and how corn came to be such a prevalent part of our diet. So I'm flipping over. I'm looking. I'm reading. I'm skimming. Okay, yeah. Any food whose provenance is so complex, obscure, that it requires expert help to ascertain. The giant tropical grass must be known as corn. Corn is in chicken nuggets, sodas, fruit drinks. Okay, high fructose corn syrup. After water, corn sweetener is a principal ingredient. Grab a beer for your beverage instead and you'll still be drinking for... Okay, so he's telling me here that corn's in just about everything. It's in the coffee that we drink, the coffee whitener, the cheese whiz, the frozen yogurt, the TV dinner. I'm still going down. I'm scanning. I'm scanning. I'm looking at the first paragraph. Corn goes beyond. Yes, story on life. Corn is the plant. Yeah, the trick doesn't yet. I'm flipping again. One would expect the rise of ZMAs in Central America. Corn came from Central America. Okay. Yes, moving down, May 1943. Yeah, moving corn won over the wheat people because of its versatile, versatility prized, especially in new settlements far from civilization. I'm flipping again. It was huge with na Native Americans married to man. I'm flipping over. I'm flipping over. Maize is self-fertilized in wind-pollinated botanical terms. Okay, so I'm still learning. I'm still learning. I'm still digesting. I'm still digesting, but I'm not focusing on every single damn word and so forth, and so forth, and so forth, okay? And then just continue through the book that way. I read that book in two hours and 10 minutes. I remember it was over at my, in my Los Feliz apartment when I read that. And I was like, I'm going to read this in an hour. And it took me twice as long, two hours and 10 minutes. And in the end, I knew everything about the difference between grass-fed beef and corn-fed beef. I understood how... Beef get, gets taken in a refrigerator or, or gets transported rather from, uh, from the farms in Iowa uh, to the west coast of the states, all this crap that's in processed foods. I mean, I understood, I understood a lot, um, uh, everything about organic, the difference between organic and non-organic. And when someone asked me now about that book, I can now talk about it with confidence. I didn't read every single damn word of that book. I skimmed over, my eyes kind of skimmed over a lot of it. I read every page. I looked at every page. I didn't read every word, but I got the gist. I got the understanding. I got the main point out of that book. Let's do another book here. Sam Walton, Made in America. Here it is. If, you can, if you're watching on the video, I'm just holding it up there. It's a small little book. I mean, it's jam-packed. It's, uh, let's have a look here. In this particular one, it's 334 pages. Now, I didn't know who Sam Walton was up until a few months ago. I didn't know that he created Walmart. And so what did I do? Before I started reading this book, I went on to Wikipedia. And I put in Sam Walton. Okay? So let's type in Sam Walton here. Sam Walton was an American businessman and entrepreneur born in Oklahoma, best known for founding the retailers Walmart and Sam's Club. Okay, so that's who he was. All right. I'm looking in the little box and it says net worth $23 billion as of 1992. And I'm looking here, it says, ah, oh, he's death. He died. Okay. He died in 1992, age 74. I didn't even know he was alive or dead when I started reading this book. And I'm reading, I'm skimming the Wikipedia page. Okay, great. Now I'm going to the back of the book. And it's saying, meet a genuine American folk hero cut from the homespun cloth of America's heartland. Sam Walton, who parlayed a single dime store in a hard scrubble cotton town into Walmart, the largest retailer in the world. The undisputed merchant king of the late 20th century, Sam never lost the common touch. Here, finally, Sam Walton tells his extraordinary story in his own inimitable words. Genuinely modest but always sure of his ambitions and achievements, Sam shares his thinking in a candid, straight-from-the-shoulder style. In a story rich with anecdotes and the rules of the road of both Main Street and Wall Street, Sam Walton chronicles the inspiration, heart, and optimism that propelled him to lasso the American dream. Okay, so now I know what I'm about to read. I'm about to read the story of a small-town guy from Oklahoma who created the biggest retail brand in the world. 
Okay. So now what am I doing? I'm going into the content section. If you're watching in the video, there's the content section. What does it say? Uh, chapter one, learning to value a dollar. Two, starting on a dime. Three, bouncing back. Four, swimming upstream. Five, raising a family. Six, recruiting the team. Seven, taking the company public. Eight, rolling out the formula. Nine, building the partnership. Ten, stepping back. Eleven, creating a culture. Twelve, making the customer number one. 13, meeting the competition. 14, expanding the circles. 15, thinking small. 16, giving something back. 17, running a successful company. 10 rules that worked for me. 18, wanting to leave a legacy. Now, I already know what Sam Walton's going to say in this book, which means I don't have to read every single miniature word. If I want, I can go to chapter 17 to read Running a Successful Company, 10 Rules That Worked for Me. That'll probably summarize the whole book. So let's go to 312, Running a Successful Company, 10 Rules That Worked for Me. Look at this. If you're watching in the video, all spelled out for you. Look at that. Rule one, commit. Rule two, share your profits. Rule three, motivate your partners. Rule four, communicate everything you possibly can to your partners. Rule five, appreciate everything your associates do for the business. Rule six, celebrate your successes. Rule seven, listen to everyone in your company. Rule eight, exceed your customers' expectations. Rule nine, control your expenses better than your competition. Rule 10, swim upstream, go the other way, ignore the conventional wisdom. Now, there are 10 life lessons from a guy who made more money than everyone listening here combined, plus probably some of the world's richest men. And it's all there. So now you've got context. Now you can go back and enjoy what's in between, but you know how the book's going to end. It's not a novel or TV show where you... you you're in suspense and you don't want to know how the story ends. You want to keep going and like, what's the point of reading a book? Okay. What's the point of reading this book, Sam Walton? It's so you can get knowledge into your brain. It's so you can learn lessons. So you can see how a, a billionaire thinks. So you can see how someone built something from scratch and turn it into the biggest retail chain in the world. It's implanting his mindset into your brain. Okay. And then being able to take that and implement the ideas that he taught or he talks about into your own life. However you do that, however you want to take away from reading this book, you're going to take away lessons, okay? So it doesn't matter that you don't read every single word. All that matters is what did you learn from reading this book? And if you can learn the 10 lessons by going to the last book, chapter and then going back and going over this quickly and taking from it what you want, then, then you've, you've harnessed everything you need from this book. But we get stuck bogged down with, oh, this book, I need a month to read it. I'll read it for 15 minutes before I go to sleep at night. This book I read in about an hour 45 and I'll show you again. So I'll show you how I'm doing it. Learning to value a dollar. So I'll, I'll, again, for the video people, I'll just put this down and I'll, I'll try and show you this way and ha- show you how quickly I'm flipping. Okay, success has always had its price, I guess. I really don't. I'm flocking down to Bentonville. So I'm a friendly fellow by nature. The Walton family instinctively put a pretty tight lid on public. Per- I'm reading the first sentence of every paragraph and skimming down below that. I'd like to explain some of my attitudes about money. I grew up in the Great Depression. My dad was an awfully hard worker. Dad never had the kind of ambition or confidence to build much of a business on his own. We never thought of ourselves as poor, although we certainly didn't have much of what you'd call disposable income lying around. Bang, I'm just flipped a page. That quickly. I'm reading the first line of every paragraph and I'm getting an idea and I'm skimming over the sentences underneath, right? By the time I got out in the world ready to make something, I already had a strongly ingrained respect for the value of a dollar. The partnership works in different ways. Moving, skimming, 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 starting on a dime. I don't know what causes a person to be ambitious, but it's a fact that I've been overblessed with drive and ambition from the time I hit the ground. Even when I was a little kid in Marshall, Missouri, I remember being ambitious, turning the page. 
I said I saved my life. Then we moved. Then we moved a lot. We moved to Columbia, Missouri. My high school athletic experience was really unbelievable because I was also the quarterback on the football team, which went under f- turning the page. So he was a quarterback. He moved a lot. Uh, closing in hand. He went to a fraternity. Also, while at Missouri, he was elected president of the Bible class. He delivered newspapers, flipping the page. Uh, got his four, four, he found a, he started his first store. He found a champion and a store manager, a guy called Duncan Majors, flipping the page. He worked for pennies for, for 18 months. By 1942, the war was on. And as a graduate, he was gung ho, but the army had a big surprise for me because of a minor heart irregular irregularity. I flunked the physical for combat duty and was classified for limited duty. This kind of got me down in the dumps. And since I was just waiting around to be caught up anyway, I quit my pennies job and wandered south towards Tulsa with some vague idea of seeing what the oil business was like. So I took time to read that. You notice how I spent a little bit of time. That was quite interesting because I read, saw the word war and I was like, oh, did he go to the war or did he not? And then I found out that he didn't. Okay. So I took a bit of time to read that. Now I'm skimming again. Got married. I was living in a town, a population over 10,000. Skimming again. I learned a tremendous amount from running a store in the Ben Franklin franchise. Yeah. Skimming, skimming, skimming. Helen borrowed $20,000 from his wife's father, from his father-in-law. Okay. Moving, skimming, skimming, skimming. Okay. So you can hear that now I'm up to chapter three already. I'm up to page, I'm on page 40, um, chapter three. So I've covered the first three chapters in about, I don't know, three or four minutes. So as you can see, I'm skimming, I'm trying, I'm stopping for really interesting parts, but I'm skimming the rest. Again, what's the main point of doing this? Someone might say, you're not really reading that book. You're not really reading a book a day because you're not reading every word. You're not digesting it. Well, I'm digesting it. I know everything about Sam Walton. I read his Wikipedia page. I read the back of the book. I read the chapters and I read the words in between. I skimmed over some of the words in between, but I understood. I understood the story. I understood that he got up in planes and flew over, sent uh, the, the, the Midwest of the US looking for potential sites to build new Walmart stores. That at one point he was the richest man in the world and that because he dispersed his wealth amongst his family, he wasn't single-handedly known as the the richest man in the world because he gave his wife and his daughter and his family, you know, family trust. So he was never considered the richest man in the world, even though if he hadn't have shared his wealth, he would have been. I know how he died. I won't, won't tell you that story. Grinding it out. The story of Ray Kroc, the making of McDonald's. He built McDonald's. Now again, Everyone knows McDonald's. You've eaten their crap food. You've seen the commercials. You know McDonald's. But did you know that the guy who created McDonald's was a guy named Ray Kroc? I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know it until I read the book on grinding it out, the making of McDonald's. So what did I do? I Googled grinding it out in Wikipedia. Gave me a summary. I then Googled Ray Kroc. Then went onto YouTube, looked at a Ray Kroc video. I went, okay, that's him. That took about three minutes. And then I look at the back of the book. Let's read it. Few entrepreneurs can claim to have actually changed the way we live, but Ray Kroc is one of them. His revolutions in food service, automation, franchising, shared national training, and advertising have earned him a place beside the men who founded not merely businesses but entire new industries. But even more interesting than Ray Kroc, the business legend is Ray Kroc the man, not your typical self-made tycoon. Kroc was 52 when he met the McDonald brothers and opened his first franchise. Now meet Ray Kroc, the man behind the business legend in his own words. Irrepressible enthusiast, perceptive people watcher, and born storyteller. He will fascinate and inspire you. You'll never forget Ray Kroc. So I didn't actually know the story of how the McDonald's franchise started. I kind of, when I read that for the first time before I read this book, I kind of remembered being told that he bought McDonald's from two brothers called McDonald's. I kind of remember, but I didn't know his name was Ray Kroc, but I, I did remember that it was founded by brothers called McDonald's, but that some other guy had taken it over. I just didn't know that his name was Ray Kroc. So when I read that, I go, oh, that's, a, that's right. That's right. So this guy, oh, and he was 52. He was 52 when he started this. So he's, 
It's like we're all beating ourselves up here in, in our 20s and 30s and 40s going, man, we're never going to make it and, you know, not being happy with our lot in life, some of us. Ray Kroc was 52 before he made it happen. Now, this interestingly doesn't have chapters, uh, a chapter heading at the beginning of the book. But I'll tell you what I do. I go into the pictures. It's got pictures in the middle of the book. Love a book with pictures. <laughs> Now, you look at the pictures before you start reading the book and you can start to get an idea of who he is. You can see, oh, that's interesting. Look, there he is with the president. Oh, that's interesting. There he is with the baseball team. Oh, did he buy the San Diego? Oh, he bought the San Diego Padres. That's interesting. Oh, there he is with Muhammad Ali. This guy was a big deal. Hmm. There's the, there he is in his army uniform. There's his father. There he is when he's young. There he is playing the piano. There he is when he's a little kid. So you're forming an idea of this guy's life, where he grew up, how he thought. Now, we go through the book. Chapter one, same thing. That fateful day in 1954, I had a freshly signed contract with the McDonald's brothers in my briefcase. My mother, Ryan's. I was born in Oak Park. I always believe that each man makes his own happiness and is responsible for his own problems. It's a simple philosophy. That's good. So already I know what kind of mindset he has. I flew out to Los Angeles one day and made some routine calls with my representative there. Then bright and early the next morning, I drove 60 miles east to San Bernardino. I cruised past the McDonald's location about 10 a.m. and I was not terrifically impressed. There was a smallish octagonal building, a very humble sort of structure situated on a corner lot about 200 feet square. So this is quite interesting. This is the first time that he set eyes on the McDonald's restaurant that was already in existence, owned by the actual McDonald's brothers. So I'm taking a little bit of time to read that because it's significant. Then I've got that part and now I move on. I'm flipping again. I'm flipping again. I'm flipping again. I'm reading the first first page. I was born in Oak Park, just southwest of Chicago city limits in 1902. I took to the piano naturally. My school year, we taught learning about his early life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to get out selling and playing the piano for money. I was a pianist from 17 years old. That's interesting. Um, my selling job, I played in a diamond dance pavilion called the Edgewater. I'm flipping again. My next job was in Chicago's financial district as a board mark. Early in 1920, 1922, uh, in 1922, I got married to Ethel. Continued. Okay, so now I've read the first two chapters, and now I know that he was he liked the piano, where he grew up, that he got married very young. I learned, um, obviously, it's fast-forwarding. The first chapter is fast-forwarding to the time where he, where he first saw the McDonald's store. So I'm, it's kind of like a Quentin Tarantino movie, like Pulp Fiction, where it's like you start and one – time zone and then you flip back to the past and then you move forward and then it's kind of like a jigsaw that way. So again, I'm just, I'm flipping through, I'm reading the first line of each chapter and I'm learning everything there is to know about Ray Kroc. Now I read that book. Now I should say as well, I like to get the, the hard copies and I like to underline certain points with the pen. So when I find something really interesting, I underline it. So I can go back and, and find it. Now, you don't have to do that. Maybe you're borrowing someone's book. I just like to do it. Let's do one more book. Sell or Be Sold by Grant Cordone. Okay. So, same thing. Going to read the back of the book. Then we're going to read the, the contents. Now, I don't actually have the back of the book here at the moment because it, it was a sleeve that goes on this book, but I've lost the sleeve. So, it was like a red cover. Uh, actually, you know what? I do have it. Here it is. It's on my floor. One second. So, yeah. So, if you're watching on the video, this is the front of the book, Sell or Be Sold. And this is the back of the book. So, let's read the back of the book, shall we? Whether it's selling your company's product in the boardroom or selling yourself on eating healthy, everything in life can and should be treated as a sale. And a sales expert, Grant Cardone, explains knowing the principles of selling is a prerequisite for success of any kind. In Sell or Be Sold, Cardone breaks down the techniques and approaches necessary to master the art of selling in any avenue. You will learn how to handle rejection, turn around negative situations, shorten sales cycles, and guarantee yourself greatness. Cardone will also teach you the success essentials of selling in a bad economy, overcoming core reluctance, 
filling your pipeline with new business, staying positive despite rejection. From the New York Times bestselling author of If You're Not First, You're Last, The Closest Survival Guide and The Ten Times Rule, Sell or Be Sold Will Change the Way You Perceive the Sale and Life. Great. I know what the book's about. Let's go to the contents. Chapter one, selling is a prerequisite for life. Beware of false data. Selling, critical to survival. Salespeople make the world go round. Salespeople drive entire economies. Sales or college, all professions rely on sales. Chapter three, professional or amateur. Chapter four, the greats, commitment, greener pastures, the power of prediction. The only reason you won't, won't like selling to qualify as great. Chapter five, selling yourself. Conviction is the make or break point. Overcoming the 90 day phenomenon. Get sold or be sold. Put your money where your mouth is. Ice to an Eskimo. Chapter six, it's love, not price. Move up, don't move down. Sales people, not customers, stop sales. Your buyer's money. There is no shortage of money. Second money is easier than first money. The more they spend, the better they feel. Chapter eight, the most interesting person in the world. Communication equals sales. Chapter nine, how to soften any buyer. The magic words. Chapter 10, credibility equals increased sales. Prospects don't make sales. Sales people do. How to handle the buyer's distrust. Help them believe you. Chapter 11, give, give, give. The magic of give, give, give. Chapter 12, the hard sell. Chapter 13, take massive action. Chapter 14, how to build your power base. Chapter 15, the lunch opportunity. Chapter 16, a great attitude is worth more than a great product. Chapter 18, determine wants and needs. Chapter 19, be honest with yourself. Never justify failure. Chapter 21, $250,000 sales success schedule. Chapter 22, quick tips to conquer the biggest challenges in selling. And so forth. So I'm already going, wow, I know what this book's about. I know exactly what I'm going to get with this book. This guy's going to teach me how to sell, how to create a great mindset. He's going to teach me how to close. He's going to teach me what to say. He's going to teach me how to be credible. So let's go through it, shall we? And I've underlined certain parts here. So I'll show you as I uh, open up the book here. So um, if you're watching on the video, you can see certain parts that I've underlined. Let's see what I've underlined. I've learned uh, more from seminars, audio programs, books, and talking with other successful business people at conferences than I learned in all my formal education. A person's ability to persuade another is the only thing that will ultimately ensure a position in the marketplace. My wife constantly asks me, how do you always get your way with people? The simple, the answer is simple because I want to. I want to have a great life for us because I try to get my way. Oh, yeah. So forth. The world would stop turning without salespeople. Learn the great art of selling and you will never be without work because you'll always be needed by others. Selling is valuable, worthy, and respectable profession and a vital life skill for all. There is no ceiling on your earning potential. No person will ever gain true power and stature in the world without the ability to persuade others. I'm skimming. I'm skimming. The difference between mediocrity and greatness lies in being committed to the profession and being consumed by the desire to be great and the dedication to learn the trade and so forth and so forth. I'm flipping. You can hear me flipping. Whenever I commit myself to any line of action, I get immediate results. When I'm not committed all the way, I find that results are delayed or non-existent. If I'm committed 100% to the customer before me, I get results. If you want to be successful at anything, you have to commit. A burn the ship kind of mentality is what it takes to get you to a place where you do things that will ensure results. Get into the game as though your life depended on it because your life does depend on it. The life that you've been dreaming of depends on you getting in getting in all the way now. So I'm reading this, I'm underlining, I'm taking times on certain points because this is resonating with me. I like this guy's attitude. I like what he's saying. Commitment equals results equals happiness. The first thing you have to do is commit to yourself to selling is something that is vital to your life regardless of your career. I have to get it done now and so forth. To become one of the greats, you have to practice, not just play. I'm flipping, I'm flipping, I'm flipping, I'm scanning, I'm scanning. I'm not reading every word. I'm scanning the first top sentences of paragraphs. You have to be 100% certain that what you're selling is better than all the other options. I believe so strongly in my service, my level of care, and the superiority of my products. I'm flipping. Being unreasonable means that you're sold on what you're selling. It is your conviction alone that will sell others on it. You must be completely in if you are to fully maximize the opportunities before you. Do not even attempt selling someone else unless you yourself are completely sold. 
I'm skimming, I'm skimming. Become so thoroughly sold on your product that your conviction is irresistible to others. I'm skimming. I'm flipping. I'm flipping. Champions decide to win the game with what they have to work with. I'm skipping. I'm skipping. I'm skimming. I'm skimming. I'm looking. I'm looking at the first word. I remember a customer who once told me that my product cost too much money and I was unable to close him. He left me and bought a product for $150,000 more from my competitor. When he said it was too much money, money, he was really saying it was too much for the solution I was offering. Salespeople, not the prospect, are the ultimate barriers to every sale. It's never about price. It's about love or confidence that the product will solve problems. It's almost never about price. So I'm learning so much about sales now. It's not about the price. It's about how good the salesperson is. It's about how you're convicting. It's how good your product is. All right? I read that book in about an hour and 15 minutes. And I walked away with it super inspired to be able to practice selling. I keep mentioning that I'm, I, I teach uh, women how to attract the top, top quality man. Part of what I have to do is get on the phone and convince them to pay me $997 to do an eight-week coaching program where I take them through steps on how to meet and attract quality guys. Hard to do that on the phone. I read that book. I got on the phone. I made more sales. I made more sales as a direct result of reading that book. Did I read every word of the book? No. Can I tell you what's in that book? Yes. Can I tell you what worked for me? Yes. Just the simple act. The main thing that I got out of that book is that really if someone buys from me or someone doesn't buy from me, it's all because of me. It's not because my product sucks because I believe in my product. I know that I'm offering tremendous value. I know that I'm inspiring people with what I do. And so if they don't buy from me, it's not because it's too expensive. It's because I haven't convinced them. Maybe I'm not sold enough on my, on my, my product. Maybe, there was an, maybe the person could pick up in my tonality that I wasn't convincing enough. Maybe I haven't positioned it properly. It's down to me. Whereas before I might say, ah, oh, I've got a price. It's too expensive. Uh, I don't know why these women won't take it. Like it's not, what's wrong with them? I don't understand why they won't take it. Like some women are so, so stupid. They're not buying this amazing product that I've created, but it wasn't their fault. It's my fault because I'm not convincing enough. I don't understand their pain enough. So I got all of that from reading that book. Did I read every single word of that book? No, I skimmed the pages. I looked at the first sentence and then let my eyes wander down and skimmed over what was underneath, but I still digested the information. I still digested what was in there. That's how you read a book a day. Now, another question I get a lot is, how do you find the time to read a book a day? Now, I'm averaging about, I would say, probably an hour 50, hour 45, hour 50 minutes per book to read a book. I wish it was an hour, but it just isn't. I'm still slow. Like, I'm still slow. I mean, you might be saying, that's incredibly fast. That's incredible. But I'm still slower than I'd like. Like, I'd like to read a book in an hour because there's stuff to do, right? You've got stuff. The life, life happens. I can tell you this. The only time that I can read that book is, when, is in the morning. I can't do it at nighttime because life gets in the way. Work's happening. I'm on the computer. I'm sending emails. I'm making phone calls. I, you know, my, my, my attention span is very limited later on in the day. So people ask me, when do you read the book? How do you create the time? This is how I do it. I wake up in the morning. I go to the gym. I work out. I get exercise. I come back. I shower. I have breakfast. And then I get the book. I put my cell phone in my bedroom. I turn it on silent. I stick it underneath the pillow so it's as far, it's far away from me as possible. I get the book. I go and sit on my sofa and I open it and I look at my watch and I go one hour. And then it doesn't happen. It takes an hour. Like I said, it takes about an hour and a half, hour, 45 minutes. But I commit to doing it and making it happen. Now, I work quite late. 
I get up early because I want to go to the gym. That's part of my routine. So on the days that I'm doing that, I'm waking up at like 6.20, 6.30. I'm walking up. I'm in the gym at 7. I'm finishing the gym at 8. I'm showered and have had breakfast and put on some clothes and sitting down to read the book and turn the page by 9 a.m. And I say I'm done here at 10 and then I'll start my day. But what happens is it usually gets to about 10.30, 10.45 and then I start my day. So then my work day will start at 10.45. And then I'll work throughout the day and I've read the book. And what I'll do is I'll take a photo of uh, the cover of the book and I'll send a WhatsApp through to Ty, Ty Lopez, who got me reading a book a day and I'll say, read. In fact, I'll show you right now uh, one of the messages that I, that I send to him. And then Ty will message back and say, great. Or he'll say, don't read that crap. <laughs> here we go if you're looking on the video this is a whatsapp message that i sent to ty it's uh i just read the one thing by gary keller and i said red and then he responded with good one that's how i create the time so think about how you can do that in your own life when can you create the time to read a book can you do it in the morning? Can you do it at night? Imagine if you did read a book a day. Let's just say on average you read four or five books a week. Five books a week. Now let's, let's just say four books a week times 52 weeks in the year makes 200 and something books, 208 books. 200 books. Imagine how, much, how smarter you would be, how much smarter you would be if you put the knowledge of Sam Walton and Ray Kroc and the Hiltons Richard Branson and Arnold Schwarzenegger. Speaking of which, this is the next book I'm going to read, Total Recall, Arnold Schwarzenegger. I've already flipped through it about four or five months ago, but I'm going to read it uh, more in depth. Now, it's a big, big-ass book. Look at that. That might take you three hours, two or three hours, but it's the same concept. You're flipping, you're scanning, you're looking at photos. You're not reading every single last word. It's a good investment. It's a good investment. I'll tell you another thing. When you do this, and by the way, send me a tweet at, at James Swanick if this has been helpful. Send me a tweet at, at James Swanick, J-A-M-E-S-S-W-A-N-W-I-C-K. Tell me what you learned. What's the number one thing you learned about speed reading in this, uh, in this, this podcast? Was this, was this helpful? Please do tweet and let me know. In fact, why don't you do this as well? When you buy a book or you get your next book, take a photo of it and go and post on my James Swanick official page and say, just read this book, James, or just about to read this book. I'd love to see you do that. Um, the other thing you can do is send a tweet out. Take a photo of the book that you're about to read or that you've just read. Take a photo of it and then send it to me as a tweet at, at James Swanick and say, read. <laughs> and I'll just know. I'll know that you've read it and I'll retweet you for sure. I would be thrilled to retweet you if you had done that. That would be great. That would make me feel so good if I've managed to inspire you to read, uh, read a book. So, again, here's a picture of my bookshelf, some of the books that I've read. Okay. Get your own bookshelf happening. Now, people also also ask me, why don't I buy on a Kindle? You can read on a Kindle. I just like to have the hard book in my hand. I don't like the swiping. It's kind of like Tinder, swipe left, swipe right. <laughs> I'd rather have the book in my hand. I'm old school. But you can read it. If you can read in Kindle and, or on your tablet and you don't want to buy physical books and it's easier for you and you, you're not going to, your reading's not going to suffer because of it, then do that. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter how you read it, just as long as you digest the information, just as long as you can summarize the book, just as long as when you're out and about at dinner parties or speaking to friends, you can talk about the books, talk about the lessons that you learn from reading it. One of the things that happens as well is that people think that you're super smart when you read a book a day. And it's guess what? They're right. You are super smart because no one does it. Nobody does it. So you say I read a book a day, people go, wow, that guy must be so smart. Now, my IQ is not that high. I'm not the smartest tool in the shed. 
but I'm wise because I got a hell of a lot of knowledge in here because I'm, I'm downloading all the knowledge from some of the world's great thinkers, the most successful businessmen, great people in history. And I'm implanting their way of thinking into my brain. So I hope this has helped. Hope this has helped. Um, yeah. Follow me on Instagram. I do take photos of the books that I read and I post it on Instagram. It's at James Swanick. My Twitter account is at James Swanick. Send me a tweet. Please do head over to James Swanick official on my Facebook and like the page. And I'm going to send you those uh, personal notes. The Never Eat Alone by Keith Ferrazzi, Winning with People, John C. Maxwell, and Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill. Amazing books. Changed my life. And the notes that I took, I typed out. I put it in a PDF. I'm going to send it to you if you do that for me. Uh, do that for me and I would really appreciate it. I hope this has been helpful. Get out there and read a book a day. If you can't read a book a day, then read a book a week. And if you don't read books at all, read a book a month. 12 books a year is still better than what you're doing now, which is zero. And uh, if you do that, you're going to, you know, people are just going to, they're going to think you're a lot smarter. You are going to be a lot smarter. And, you, and it's going to inspire you. So I hope this has been helpful. If you've got any questions, please do uh, ask me the questions on the, fan, on the fan page, James Swanick Official. Ask me a question or send me a tweet and I will answer your question there. All right, that is it for me. Thanks so much for watching. If you're watching on the video, thanks so much for listening. I'll catch you on the next one. See you.